Hi, everyone, and thanks for giving us your time today. I'm Ian Hamilton, and in case you're new here, I'm recording this from our studio in virtual reality. I'm wearing Quest 2 with hand tracking and meta avatars, and I'm joined by my co-host, David Heaney, who is on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, and we've never met in the physical world. We come together each week to talk about the latest developments shaping the next generation of personal computing, and we, share, we air this show live on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific. VR Download is available for listening in every major podcast platform. Let's get into it, Heaney. What do we have today? So today we're going to talk about Tim Cook's hint about Apple's rumored headset. We're going to talk about SideQuest's new native app for Quest 2 that allows you to sideload apps from inside VR. And we're going to talk about Brad Lynch's findings and what they tell us about Valve's Deckard rumored upcoming standalone headset. Hi, Guy. Hi, Anthony. Everyone else. Uh, Onakazi, thank you for coming back. Adam, everyone for tuning in. Thank you for being live. Sorry I was traveling last week. Uh, that was a heck of a drive across the United States. Nothing like a good trip in the real world to remind you uh, how nice it is to stay at home and use VR for certain things, right? This first subject, Tim Cook's hint about Apple's rumor headset. Heaney, we've been hearing about Apple's headset for ages. For the watchers out there, it's been more than half a decade uh, for some people to have been hearing this stuff. What is this latest comment telling us that we haven't heard before? Yeah, as you say, we have been hearing about Apple's rumored headset for a very long time. It's also probably one of the most common, if not the most common topic that we discuss on this show. And so the latest news here comes from an interview that Tim Cook gave with China Daily. And the reporter said, Chinese consumers are highly enthusiastic about VR and AR, but aren't very satisfied with the products currently on the market. And then they asked, what do you think are the key factors for AR products such as AR headsets to succeed in the consumer market? And in Tim Cook's answer, which was quite long, you, you can read in our full article on our website, he said that he couldn't be more excited about the opportunities we see in this space and stay tuned and see what we will have to offer. So there's nothing of any informational basis here, but it is just a kind of hint that Cook is ready to start basically teasing about this hardware. It's at the point where beforehand, Apple executives would say almost nothing if asked about this. Uh, about a year ago, The Verge asked uh, Craig Federini about how the software is coming along for the mixed reality headset. That was the exact question. Sorry, it was the Wall Street Journal, not The Verge. And uh, Craig just laughed and said, I don't know what you're talking about. So the fact that we're now at the point where executives are not going to say, oh, I, I don't know what you're talking about, and just give them a little hint, even if it's the most vague possible hint you can imagine, means that the rumors that Apple is preparing to announce this thing in early 2023 could be right. Yeah, I think there's some question uh, still out there in the market about whether Apple's actually going to follow through here, right? Uh, Apple is known for cutting products late in the development cycle, just going back to the drawing board and trying again. And some of the latest rumors we've heard about Apple are things like them showing it to the board of directors of the company, right, Heaney? Yeah, Bloomberg did recently report that they've heavily ramped up uh, work on the operating system, Reality OS, which we know is a thing because it's been seen in App Store upload logs. It was seen in an Apple GitHub project and an Apple shell company recently trademarked Reality OS. So we do know that that operating system is definitely a thing. Bloomberg has reported that work's ramped up on it. Bloomberg has also reported, as we spoke about in previous episodes, that Apple is porting its core software, like Calendar and Notes and Maps, to this headset, that they're building out the developer tools for the headset. And so I, I would be heavily skeptical of the idea that this is going to be dropped. It seems that too many things are coming together that this product's going to be dropped. What we have heard is that it is heavily delayed and that they're working through issues such as overheating. But... You know, recently this week, Bloomberg reiterated uh, a report from the information that this thing would have the M2 processor that just shipped in the latest MacBook Pro and MacBook Air. So getting a laptop grade processor into a slim and lightweight headset like this is always going to be a challenge. And that seems to be what's really holding this up. 
Yeah, and there was this really great question from Seabakes right at the beginning of our chat log here. And I think we'll probably come back to the answers throughout the show. So the question was, is anyone else going to be upgrading from a Quest 1 to Cambria this fall? I'd also like to add to that, is anyone going to be upgrading from Quest 2 to Cambria this fall? Is that Are there people out there that have already made up their mind and that's a done deal? Uh, I'd love to see some interesting comments in the res- in the responses uh, throughout this show. I think we could get into some of those comments of how people are weighing whether or not to upgrade uh, when that headset hits. Yeah, I think with all technology, it's people tend to not upgrade from generation to generation. Even though you know Cambria isn't Quest three, it is going to be the first Pro headset available. So generally, people upgrade either from one or two generations in in the past rather than going straight from something like Quest two. So that will be an interesting jump all the way from Quest 1 to Cambria, if that person does follow through with that. Yeah, so let's get into the second subject. I think it's very interesting, and actually it goes into some fairly different areas because it's it's significant that even in 2022, Meta is allowing this to exist on its platform. So said SideQuest has a new native app on Quest headsets. You can go and install this using the easy setup over on SideQuest's website. And I believe it works on both Quest 1 and Quest 2. But on Quest 2, uh, where you've got all the horsepower, you can do some pretty cool things uh, very quickly. So I was able to install this new version of SideQuest and immediately download the Star Trek The Next Generation bridge with sound effects and a view screen showing the stars running by me, running by my ship. And then I had multitasking on to put SideQuest over here, right next to the main store. Now, SideQuest has obviously been in a major transformation since Oculus has gone and supported App Lab content, or Facebook Meta has gone and supported experimental App Lab content. So you as a developer can go and list something via App Lab. And if you go and search in the store here, you won't be able to find it, right, Heaney? But if you go and search over here, you can find it, can't you now? Yeah, uh, Heaney, why don't you go into what you think the significance of SideQuest is being available in VR? Yeah, so you could already sideload the Android phone app of SideQuest and use it in, directly in Quest, but it obviously wasn't directly optimized for being used in VR. So this is more of a quality of life thing. But as you mentioned, the really useful update, as you sort of alluded to there, but didn't say specifically, is that you can install custom homes just like this. That's what you, you mean when you're talking about putting the Star Trek bridge into VR in the same way that you get this kind of predefined selection of nine or 10 oculus homes right now or horizon homes as i guess they're now called you can get all of these different 3d models just like the star trek bridge and this is something that's been possible in steam vr and it was actually possible on the rifts uh, home system for a while but i think this is something that a lot of people are going to really appreciate because you don't want these generic meta environments in most cases you want to have you know if you're a fan of Uh, rick and morty maybe you want to be in the rick and morty shed or if you're a fan of the simpsons you want to be in the simpsons home people have their own kind of fandoms and that's what they want to kind of connect to in their home i I do think that we did hear that meta is going to support this themselves over time and allow custom homes to come in but again you'll probably be restricted to ips that aren't copyrighted anyway so there's always going to be this space for sidequest and that's in general the reason that sidequest is always going to be there there's always going to be things that meta restricts from App Lab, restricts from the main store. And that's, in many ways, a lot of the gems of SideQuest, including, as people were talking about in the comments earlier, Plutosphere, that PC VR cloud streaming system that lets you play PC VR titles if you don't even own a gaming PC, which is huge and one of the main uses of SideQuest. Yeah, you brought up licensing and official support on the platform side, and that's where I'm really curious to to see where this goes in the future. The fact that SideQuest is able to put this interface directly into the headset, surface a lot of content you can't get officially. One of the things I was able to do with the SideQuest app more efficiently than before was I have, I purchased Doom, the original Doom on Steam, and I went and downloaded it very quickly from my Steam library. And then over on the easy interface 
for side quest, I just selected which folder had the original doom.wad file in it and put that on my quest. Then I went inside the side quest app inside the headset and installed the quest z doom files directly inside the headset. I didn't leave the headset for that part of it. And because I had already pulled over that original file from the PC, it worked with the Quest Z Doom mod, and boom, I was running around inside the original Doom maps with a 3D weapon and uh, had that full experience. And uh, it, it wasn't completely inside VR. That original file still needed to come over from PC, but it made uh, sideloading those VR ports that, I mean, I paid for that game. Uh, it made it really easy to get into. Yeah, as you say, those are the two caveats here. You still need to use a PC to install this onto your Quest in the first place to put the SideQuest VR app on, and you still need to drag over the files from your PC to install some of these uh, VR conversions of those old games. But otherwise, when you're just installing general VR games and the actual uh, application, not just the, the content files, it's all doable in VR. And that is a game changer because that Android app before worked, but it really was not optimal. It was clearly designed to be on a smartphone touchscreen. And, you know, I only tried this very briefly, but the interface seems completely designed for VR. It feels just as smooth as using the uh, built-in Oculus Net system menu. So Meta has shown some interest in charging for avatar items, uh, clothing, that's one of the things that are launching from Meta right now is an avatars store. So you can put uh, paid for clothing on your avatar that's, I guess, officially licensed. But there are a lot of situations where people just want to share their screen with one another without having to pay, I don't know, a licensing fee before they you know, show anything that, that's on that screen. Um, and it's one of these areas that we've been watching right before I came in here. Uh, Meta put out a blog post explaining some new features for horizon home. There'll be an article up on our website on it very quickly where you can actually watch some shared content with another person. I just, I, I wonder whether every single thing that you share and view across networks in the metaverse has to be officially licensed. We obviously see a much you know, a lot of unlicensed stuff happening over in VR chat. Does Meta really have to license every layer of their interface going forward? The Star Trek Next Generation interface, it's a beautiful Horizon home, and I would love to have people over in to check out that home. But am I am I robbing uh, someone of some uh, some artist out there of getting you know getting paid for Star Trek: The Next Generation from 30 years ago because I you know I didn't pay uh, Paramount an official licensing fee there. I don't know. It's going to be something. It's going to be an area to watch. I think. So one thing I haven't tried yet. Um, what actually does happen if you try to invite someone into your Horizon home when you're using a custom home? Does it just fall back to whatever the official home you had, or, or does it try to download it over the network? It's something I haven't actually tried yet if, if anyone in the comments has tried that please let us know horizon home only launched within the past few weeks so i don't know if anyone's had the chance to try it but it, it is an interesting question yeah and that's right before we came here that's why i brought that up where you know meta puts out these updates where the feature isn't active but it will be uh once they flip a switch basically on the server side and i'm thinking that switch probably got flipped on within the last day or two or even today and so we'll we'll be able to test this stuff out and see what the extent of these features are. We ready to move on to the next subject, or is there anything else you want to get into here? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, you talked that there is some content you can watch in Horizon Home for now. As far as we know, it's just a few Lionsgate movies. So they, Meta's obviously making these partnerships one by one, and I expect that that is how it will have to happen, unfortunately. It will be, you know, between the actual owners of the content, in this case, Lionsgate, Next, it'll be, you know, Sony Pictures or whatever the next studio happens to be, and maybe Netflix, maybe Disney in the very long term. But each one of those partnerships is probably one of those things that requires a lot of board to board meetings and lawyers and, you know, a lot of negotiation that ends up getting it. And it, I don't imagine this is something that's going to come quickly in one fraud gate. It's probably something they're going to have to do very slowly over the entire decade. Just to respond quickly to uh, Zach Wilder's question, will you be able to play the games on Cambria that you can on Quest 2? Yes, from everything Meta has said, Cambria runs the same software and has the access to the same library 
as Quest 2. The only difference is it has those extra capabilities like a color pass through. So there will be some content eventually. Meta has said that will not will only run on Cambria, but will not run on Quest 2. That's something they've said that will, will happen eventually. But as far as the other way around, yeah, anything on Quest 2 can be played on Cambria. Yeah, that's one of those lines that came direct from Mark Zuckerberg that future headsets are going to be compatible with Quest content going forward, right? That's been a fundamental plan across their platform. And it's one of the things with their controllers, right, Heaney, where you go back to the original Oculus Touch from 2016 uh, timeframe, those controllers are fundamentally still the same button layout and functionality going all the way through so many years later even when other uh, systems have had to change that input scheme. So there's a lot of continuity uh, amongst some of that, right? There, it's, it's still kind of like tragic that Oculus Go and Gear VR content has gone off to a field to die. But uh, we've, we've got uh, a lot of stuff that is continuing to be supported across all those devices, right? Yeah, it really is just down to the, the controllers. The controllers are what marks off the compatibility in, in Facebook slash Meta slash Oculus's ecosystem. You know, with Gear VR and Go being this rotational laser pointer that only had a touchpad, that's how they marked off all that content. But the original Oculus Rift, the Rift S, the Quest, and the Quest 2 all have an index trigger, a grip trigger, two buttons, a, th a thumbstick, and two menu buttons on each controller. They have identical input, and therefore Meta decides that the content can be continued over with no kind of demarcation. So that, that in a way, though, that is a negative in that they are now kind of backed into that corner. They, they can't really evolve the input scheme of those controllers without breaking backwards compatibility. And I wonder how that will limit them in terms of making a, ma a more mass market device. Because yes, you can just go to hand tracking for the mass market. For the, When I say the mass market, I'm talking about you know tens, if not hundreds of millions of people rather than a smaller number of gamers. But how will they make a controller that is more natural for people, that it doesn't feel like an Xbox controller that you know people who aren't gamers are really not comfortable with, but that is also going to be compatible with past content? That seems like it'll be a huge challenge for Meta in the long term. Yeah, I don't know how related it is, but I, I do. I've been playing Diablo Immortal on a uh, tablet, and I use a gamepad for almost all of those interactions. And it, I think of when the iPad originally came out being, was it 2010, I think it was? So 12 years for a really, I mean, they've had Minecraft on there for a long time supporting gamepad. But, you know, people complain about Apple not supporting games. Whereas uh, this is it's a great experience with a gamepad, but I'm having to use a legacy input system on a tablet and it only really got really robust support for those gamepads a decade from, you know, a decade after launch. And it's interesting to think how many years it might take VR to support that same kind of, uh, I don't know, input fidelity. It might take, you know, a better part of a decade for like, I don't know, hand tracking interactions with maybe some haptic because pe people out there in our comments every week point out when you don't have any haptic feedback whatsoever from from hand tracking, it can be really rough. But there's still that thing, Heaney, that we've talked about where the wrist might vibrate a little bit and give you that sensation. And we could still be half a decade out from that whole input scheme being able to bridge this gap we're talking about, right? Yeah, it seems like there is a space in the middle for something that is provides a higher level of haptics than just your hands freely in the air, but isn't so kind of clunky and overcomplicated compared to buttons and thumbsticks that you can't see and triggers that, yes, if you're a gamer, you're fully comfortable with that. But if, as anyone will know, if you've ever tried to put Oculus Touch controllers in the hands of someone who has never held a gamepad, you'll see exactly why that's not going to work in the mass market. It's just... The fact that they can't see it and they don't know where the buttons are, it just makes it a completely non-viable thing. It's not something that, you know, your grandmother's going to use. It's not something that and the people who are not core gamers are going to be using for everyday tasks, obviously. But again, just to be clear, because people will accuse us of saying this is going to go away, for core gamers, I imagine it will be around for a very, very, very long time. Yeah, great perspective there. Yeah, a lot of things to consider about input over the long term. 
I just, we can't even fathom what it's going to be five to 10 years from now. And uh, the haptic gloves we all know are so hard to do. So it's going to be a long path to get there. All right. The last subject on our planned uh, subjects list here is talking about the Valve standalone headset. So there are some more findings from Brad Lynch. Uh, Sadly, it's Bradley on YouTube. We have in our comments on occasion. Uh, Basically going through some of these latest findings in depth. We even have a guest post by Bradley uh, on our website going through some of these findings. Heaney, what what can we take away from sort of these code dives that are happening? Yeah, so as you say there, we have a guest post on our website that I would really recommend anyone who's interested in digging down into these specific findings reads. And it's Brad Lynch, sadly it's Bradley, and his associates from his Discord, which include, I think it's Samulia and Reggio4 and a few others, uh, Basti as well, Basti564. They all kind of dig into the Steam VR files after every update and see what has Valve accidentally, or although some people would uh, speculate purposely left in these files that is not related to their current hardware the index and steam vr supported devices but is instead designed around future standalone hardware and that's where you see hints that valve is obviously then working on some sort of standalone system and this is something that has been found since back in september when this references to this headset codename deckard were originally found including things like a standalone system layer and a binary that would load in uh, Linux default application as, as the headset boots up. And so, yeah, th- this week in the past few weeks, even more findings have emerged that suggest even more. So there is a new system menu hidden within Steam VR that appears to have a lot of the same terminology for uh, OS updates and firmware updates as the Steam Deck, which is itself you know, a, a standalone system, a handheld, not a VR system, but a handheld standalone system. Uh, there is a standalone system layer. We have references to a Wi-Fi system. Again, something like a Valve Index does not have Wi-Fi. It just connects directly to a PC. There's also this new process called XR Service Cal, which is reference to calibration, as was found in the files, which is likely to do with some sort of computer vision-based tracking system rather than a lighthouse. It's been known in the past that Valve was working with a startup called Arctus Industries, and they've even been actually quite open on their Twitter that they're working on things like uh, simultaneous location and mapping, which is the name of the algorithm, the type of algorithm that's used on inside out headsets to position themselves in the space. They've been working on tracking IR LED blobs, which is how you know Oculus Quest controllers work, or how Windows Mixed Reality controllers work, how Vive Focus controllers work. So there is that's even more hints that this is a standalone. Uh, we've also seen references to Deckard Dev Tools. That's very unambiguous as to what that could mean. The name of the headset plus Dev Tools. Valve is starting to work on the kind of tools that developers need to make content for this. There's also a very interesting menu that was found, which allows you to create a Wi-Fi hotspot on your PC for the headset to directly connect to. So that's uh, we, we heard back in September that there's evidence that this headset will be able to wirelessly stream from your PC in the same way that Oculus Link and virtual desktop work. But instead of having to go through your home Wi-Fi network all the way through your router, this looks like you'll be able to t- connect directly to the PC. And interestingly, that's something that we saw Meta is planning to do with a dedicated hardware device, a dongle that they're working on with D-Link. The manual for that leaked a while ago. You can read about that on our website or look back a few episodes. So it'll be interesting to see how Valve is able to support this without dedicated hardware. Obviously, this is for laptops or PCs with a Wi-Fi card, but that would be open it up to a lot more people than requiring a specific uh, device. The last interesting finding was a new Steam VR room setup. So, current if you use Steam VR uh, like on a Valve Index or Vive, you'll know that currently you set up your room outside VR. You walk around with the controller, you place the headset on the floor, but it looks like, according to Bradley and his associates' finding, there will now be an in VR setup, just like in Quest, and that wouldn't really make sense for something like Lighthouse because you already have to set up the headset itself. But if you have a standalone headset that has inside out tracking, it makes a lot more sense. So it's more and more hints that Valve is working on this headset. 
The one thing we don't know is when is it going to release? Does Valve actually have plans to productize this in the very short term? But all of these hints coming together do suggest that this project is getting further and further along. And, you know, Bradlin speculates that it is getting into its final stages and very soon to productize. I, I don't know if I agree with that. And I don't mean that I disagree. I mean, I genuinely do not know. I don't see evidence either way that suggests that either this is very early or very late. It just seems like it could be either way and we need more information. Yeah, that's an interesting comment on sort of the the time frame for this release. I seem to recall uh, like a throwaway comment and I'm gonna, that I'm going to have to remember years years afterwards i might have brought it up previously but back at the launch of the index there was you know people it had uh cameras on it right they had it had outward facing cameras and so it was an obvious question what are you going to be doing with those cameras and over this entire interim of years they really haven't done too much right they showed uh back at that launch some overlays so you could colorize and do some weird things with your perception of the surroundings, but it's almost like a developer platform that Valve uh, decided not to actually give give yet to people, right? Yeah, but they did release a pretty major update, I think it was last year, where they worked with Arctus Industries, that computer vision startup I was talking about earlier, to turn the index pass-through from 2D to 3D. So beforehand, it was 2D, as in not depth correct, everything looked huge, and there was no sense of depth. And now if you enable room view 3D on index, you get 3D pass through just like you get on quests. Although it wasn't actually there on quest at launch, it was added as a software update to quest one and then carried through to quest two. Index got that same update. It is a little bit more, what's I don't know what the word would be, stretchy in that the closer you bring objects to you, the more distortion there is because it's a very difficult task to get to reproject two cameras into something that is depth correct to your eyes perspective but it is fairly convincing i do remember that when the index launched valve noted that those cameras were they had were designed to prioritize clarity over latency so they weren't actually low latency enough to be used for something like computer vision uh head tracking slam but they would but obviously that you know that pass through is still incredibly useful and it's still much higher quality than what we see on a quest it's it's full color and it is hd it's just a little bit too distorted and a little bit too high latency to be really really useful so the comment from someone at valve that i'm you know quoting years later can barely remember uh, it's probably i don't know if i was recording an interview at the time but the comment was more or less we understand the value of computer vision right like there was no question back in 2019 when valve launched that headset using the lighthouse base stations you know, they think that's the best tracking there is in the market. And yes, it's super expensive. But I think it's significant that uh, Meta, you know, we, we looked at what Meta and Facebook did back in 2019 with the Guardian system on the original Quest. And it was, it felt like a leap forward, technologically speaking, to be able to set up your whole room inside of a headset. And it made all of these other systems seem to be lagging. Uh, by comparison. But I think it's also significant when you think about that, that you could you could look at that gap in the same from two perspectives, right? Here's Meta being more advanced than everyone else, but you could also look at that as every other company is saying it's just not good enough yet. We need to have more things in there before actually shipping this as a system level feature. And I, you know, if you think about what Apple and Google even canceling all of its efforts it kind of goes to this sense of yeah they're just saying everything isn't good enough and computer vision based recognition of your environment could be the critical feature a lot of these companies need to get good enough for them to sit to, to ship some of these things right Heaney? I'm, I'm not sure i agree i think with valve specifically it's just that they went down this specific technology path that they've been working on since 2015 you know, Lighthouse, it has all of its advantages. It is high quality and it works, but it's incredibly expensive. You know, it's $150 per base station. Two base stations cost as much as an entire Quest 2. It's great for niche PAR users that want to have all of these different kind of Vive trackers attached to them. It's 
great for enterprise, but for the vast majority of users, it's just ridiculously over-engineered. It's not what they really want or need. And when it comes, I don't think Valve's decision to not go to computer vision-based tracking yet is based on not thinking it's good enough. According to the Ars Technica report that came out when Brad Lynch reported his first findings back in September, Valve actually was working on exactly that, but they struggled to do it. One of the reasons that Meta was first isn't because they decided to lower the quality bar. It's that they invested heavily in computer vision. They acquired three of the most cutting edge computer vision startups in the world after they acquired Oculus, including 13th Lab, uh, what was it, Occipital, I can't remember the other one off the top of my name, but they came out, they were a team that came out of Oxford University. These were the startups that everyone was looking at and saying, okay, they're the furthest along and Meta acquired them. And they put in, they gave those people the, the engineering resources and the priority to just work on this problem. Whereas Google was focused on competing with Apple's AR kit with their own AR core. Apple obviously has its own kind of issues with its headset project in that it changed from being a wireless console into being a standalone. And with Valve, they kind of invested heavily in this lighthouse system and computer vision wasn't their focus. So now that there's now that computer vision has become something that is kind of proliferated throughout the industry, now that it is something that, you know, almost any company that wants can build something like this if they hire the right engineers because the state of the art is just advanced so far. This is something that we can see across the board. If you use the Pico Neo 3, for example, it's pretty much an identical experience. You've got your in VR in a black and white view, you point and draw a guardian. You know, if you, if you weren't someone who paid attention to detail, you wouldn't know you're not in a Quest 2 when you're setting up the Pico boundary. And it's the same with the Vive Focus 3 as well. It's, it's exactly the same experience, just with arguably a slightly, slightly worse quality of tracking, but it depends on who you ask. Hmm. Yeah, and Guy pointing out in our comments that HTC Pico Linux links have all done computer based computer based tracking, and that's a very valid point. I still, I, I think for the market size, some of these companies want to achieve. If you're looking at Google or Apple, uh, they want to get to the hundreds of millions of people with their devices, and I do think you need computer vision based tracking that alerts you to objects in your environment uh it's a safety system i think you need to have at that scale uh personally i don't know maybe i'm wrong uh i don't think that's what's stopping anyone from buying a quest 2 i think it's going to be essential in future devices that you have this but i don't think it's something that's kind of a barrier to enter at this point i don't think anyone's saying oh i would get this if only it alerted me but i could i could be wrong maybe that is even if that is what's holding them back, I don't think it's why Apple and Google haven't launched yet. I don't think they're sitting there waiting for these features. I think, you know, we've talked before in this podcast, we know the specific reasons that Apple and Google haven't launched yet. Google's was that they invested heavily in trying to compete with AR Core as fast as they could. Sorry, with AR Kit. They put all of their AR VR people into that. They forgot about, you know, actually working on a, a headset project. And because they were so focused on not delivering hardware, they bled engineers out to Meta. In that same time, Zuckerberg told these engineers, we'll pay you more and we'll let you actually ship real products. And you know, we know the reasons about Apple too in the recent reports. It, Apple was focused on building this wireless console that they could have shipped years ago, but instead Johnny Ive decided that he wanted it to be a standalone headset and they had to switch around the project and try to do what a a box connected to a, a outlet with a proper Mac level processor could do and shove that all into a lightweight headset. Yeah, you're, you're right. I, 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 we do know those things. I always feel like those reasons kind of hover above the, you know, the actual email that uh, Tim Cook or Johnny Ive sent out and someone over at Google sent out saying, you know, it's, it's just not going to be there in the near term. We don't have the right stuff. Let's go focus on, on, this priority instead uh, near term. You know, I, we hear things from Apple about how uh, completely virtual worlds are kind of off limits. I think that's the way some of those articles have referred to it, that there needs to be kind of like a, a layer of helping you focus more on the real world better using this technology. And uh, I don't know. It, you're, you're right. We, we do have those reasons and understand it, but I still, you know, there is a fundamental decision made at some level of management and we kind of don't know 
where the blame ultimately lies with with some of these calls that could leave the company that's number one in the world right now as number five in the future uh if if things don't play out right i I think it's the case as we've spoken about before that a lot of these executives don't or at least didn't until very very recently actually recognize that vr and ar were potentially huge markets to you know we we know for certain from listening to how the oculus co-founders uh, talked about the way they were received in the larger industry that back in 2014 almost no executive in the tech industry thought vr would be a real thing at most they thought it was a gimmick at least they thought it was something that would just quickly die off as as some crazy kickstarter idea and so we're talking about in this era when these executives were still thinking this mark zuckerberg spent three billion dollars to acquire a startup and then spent you know close to 10 billion dollars every year to expand research and development and build out a product line here that's why they have this advantage but in in the past few years with the success of quest and quest 2 reportedly these tech companies have clued in and realized okay this is a real market and it just takes time to go from that position of actually recognizing that this is something real to getting to the point where you can ship your own products fascinating stuff there any other comments we want to get into and let us know if you've got any last minute questions we kind of got through this news pretty quickly we're in the middle of summer now and news 10 does tend to sort of slow down over the summer months uh the same thing kind of happens at companies uh, everywhere where people start taking their summer vacations in the summer and there's a lot of out of office messages when you're messaging various folks and uh, just generally, uh, industry-wide, things start to slow down. Uh, I always, I also wonder seasonally, Heaney, I've seen some jokes on Twitter. I think uh, it was either Alex or Skiva, someone talking about how hot it gets, right, during the summer months, right? Like, it, it VR is kind of built, purpose-built for a winter system, right, where you don't have to worry about overheating. Uh, so we know at the end of this year, things are going to pick up uh, to an extraordinary degree, right? Yeah, that is a real concern when playing VR in the summer. There's a lot of parts of the world where it's just impractical with today's headsets. And it's one of the problems with the idea that some people have that it doesn't matter if a headset is heavy and bulky because you can just balance it out with the right counterbalance. For example, the Valve Index is, is heavier than most headsets, but it's more comfortable than most headsets because it's counterbalanced. But that theory falls apart in the winter because at the end of the day, when you're just trying to balance something heavy, it's a kind of a house of cards in that you still have this stuffy kind of weight pushed against your head. Maybe it's distributed better, but in a future where we have these heavy or sorry, incredibly lightweight headsets that are, have a very low footprint, hopefully you should have a lot less heat uh, trapped within that because there's a lot less space for it and there's and better cooling. Uh, to come back to Artful's comment, you're saying Apple's room mapping thing is now live on the new phones and it's cool how it recognizes mirrors. Yep, that is a really, really interesting room plan where you can get uh, any of the iPhones or iPads that have a LiDAR, the, the iPhone Pros and the iPad Pros, and scan in your room. And it's incredibly high quality how it will recognize you know, your shelves and your cupboards and your walls and your furniture. And that's something that we expect to be a big feature of Apple's headset. Arguably, it's another hint that Apple really is working on this headset because, you know, yes, that's kind of useful for mobile AR, but the appeal of mobile AR was always overstated. I, the, it's one of those things where the difference between how the tech industry talks about something and how real people care about it is just so wide. Very few people really like the interface of augmented reality through a, a little rectangle in your hand. It's just awkward and weird, and it's not something that really catches on. If you talk to any Pokemon Go player, the vast majority of time, they just turn off AR and they play it just normally with a, a default kind of background. That's because it's AR is not really compelling until you see it through a head-mounted device, until it really is you're looking directly at the world and see that object locked not through a two-dimensional phone screen where you're losing the actual sense of depth and position. It just looks like you're taking a picture with a filter in it. It doesn't really feel like you've augmented your reality. Yeah, I follow the head of Alton Dynamics on Twitter, and he's been sort of uh, nonstop uh, tweeting on his timeline about how uh, Meta's, what it showed off with Room Plan outstrips the best in the market computer vision technology that we've seen for years from Meta. So right right in the same time frame, Meta rolled out this room setup feature that when you look at what 
Apple is pulling out of those devices, out of those phones, it's a really impressive scan in a very short amount of time, right, Heaney? Well, I do think that's a completely unfair comparison because with the Quest 2, you have incredibly low resolution black and white sensors. And with an iPhone, you have not only high quality color cameras, but the iPhones that support this have a LiDAR, you know, that that is giving you hardware level depth understanding. And again, you're talking about a $300 device versus a $1,000 device. So is Apple's actual computer vision software better? I suspect no. I suspect it's probably roughly equal. It's just that the actual hardware, the, in, the, the input that it's being fed is simply much, much richer. So if you had a Quest with color cameras and depth sensors, i.e. Cambria, then the real comparison is true. So mm. let's compare room plan to what Cambria gets in its uh, first year software updates that add computer vision features that have been hinted at. So once once both of these companies have headsets on the market, we can compare one to one what those hardware platforms are providing software wise uh, based on based on that sensor suite. And before we get there, it makes these comparisons pretty hard to make. I think it's the takeaway there then is that Apple is very, very serious about computer vision and providing some of the same features, but until we see the hardware to match, it becomes impossible to, yeah, it's a great point. I saw it in our comments pointing out $300 uh, headset versus a thousand dollar phone is not a, not a justifiable so I, comparison. I, you know, for me, the real comparison that I will find interesting is how do both of these companies, how well do both of these companies do this kind of room scanning when there isn't a depth sensor? So in, in computer vision, there's this idea of RGB sensors, these RGB dash D. So RGB being color, you know, red, green, and blue. RGB dash D being red, green, and blue plus depth. You get that fourth channel depth. The interesting thing to me is not what can Cambria do with a depth sensor. It's what can Quest 3 and Quest 4 do without a depth sensor, assuming they won't have one. And I'm making that assumption because a depth sensor adds cost. And then the lower end Quest line is generally designed to be low cost. And in my view, will probably not have such a depth sensor. That's the really hard computer vision challenge. When you have depth, it's more of a hardware issue than a software issue. Just like in self-driving cars, you have this competition between LiDAR-equipped robo-taxis like Waymo and Cruise that are you know, hundred to $200,000 versus Tesla and Mobileye where they're trying to do the same thing with just cameras, no hardware level depth understanding that they can ship in you know, $40,000 cars. That's the interesting question to me. What happens, how quickly do we get headsets that are low cost that use just regular RGB sensors that can do the same kind of scanning. That is where it's all software. It's all AI. And that is where I really want to see how far has Apple caught up because Apple five years ago was dead last in the big tech companies when it came to machine learning. But in recent years, they've really, really started to catch up. And I'm, I'm, when, when we see how they do without a depth sensor, we'll know just how far they've caught up. And just to relate that quest uh, three question back, someone has asked in the comments, is there any Quest 3 news? Uh, no is the answer, other than there was a report from the information that said that the next Quest in the main line will come next year, 2023. We don't know if that is Quest 3. I, If I had to make an educated guess, and as I've said on this uh, podcast before, I would guess that Quest 3 comes out around Christmas 2023. Yeah, while you were talking about the depth sensor, Heaney, I, I really started to think about that that other thing we come back to about them separating the controller from you know the packaging, right? I, I wonder whether they could go to a four hundred dollar price again, right? They could pack in that depth sensor uh, for four hundred dollars with the controllers as part of that package, uh, and then go under that by removing the controllers but you it, I, i'm still it's hard for me to imagine them going 2023 with a new headset that doesn't doesn't do top tier hand tracking and you've been arguing that maybe just the, the higher resolution on the cameras themselves are going to deliver that while at the same time talking about the advantages of this depth sensor i it's hard for me to to figure out exactly what's going to make the cut there yeah, I, I think, again, I would say it's very unlikely we'll see a depth sensor, even at $400. If you look at those iPhones that have this this LiDAR sensor, they are, they're $1,000. They're not cheap devices at all. 
It's not something that's in the main iPhone line. It's only in the iPhone Pro. Same thing for the iPad. It's not in the iPad. It's not in the iPad Air. It's only in the iPad Pro. So it's just, they will be able to achieve better hand tracking with those higher resolution cameras, with better uh, processors. And as we've seen with Quest 2's hand tracking 2.0 update with better software, it is a significantly better experience than it was before. So this, it just becomes a machine learning problem. You, you know, does it need to be as good as Cambria? No, but if it's going to be a $300 headset, it can't be as good as Cambria, which is going to be significantly over $800. It's just how technology works. You can't get something that is simultaneously a quarter of the price and better a year later. You can get something that is lower price and better, but you can't get a quarter and better in, in one year. You can do it maybe in three, four, five years, but not in one. Hmm. One year, I mean, with the release schedule of these headsets, right? We've talked about this idea that headsets aren't going to be on the, that schedule where they release every year. We've got a lot of evidence that it's uh, m not necessarily as long as a console cycle, but definitely not going to be a cell phone cycle for new headsets, right? Yeah, I think if you look at what's happening, uh, it seems likely to me that we're, we're looking at a three-year cycle for the main Quest line where if you look at Quest 2, it actually used a processor that was three years later than Quest 1's. Quest 1 shipped with a two-year-old processor. So Quest 2 arrived, arrived from a processor perspective, it arrived three years later than Quest 1. And I expect that if, you know, by 2023, that would be Quest 3 arriving three years later. James O'Loughlin, to be clear, I'm, I'm not talking about the true depth sensor on the front of the iPhone. I'm talking about the LiDAR sensor on the back. The true depth sensor is uh, for a lot shorter range. It's uh, not really the same, you know, it's, it's similar technology in that it is a, a hardware level depth sensor on the front, but doing that for a face that's right beside the phone versus an entire room that's, you know, five meters out in length is a slightly different task. And that's why we see that. But, but even that true depth sensor, it's not on the iPhone SE that costs $400. It's on... The cheapest iPhone it's on costs seven hundred dollars. You know, iPhones are not cheap devices for not just because Apple has a big profit margin, but because they do shove all of this hardware into it, and these are not cheap devices. If you look at what Meta is trying to do with their main Quest line, these are three hundred dollar devices. Heaney, that uh, question from Zach: Do we know Cambria is getting lidar or time of flight for depth, and not just patterned light like the Connect One? So they haven't said, they haven't been very specific, but again, there's not much of a difference between that in, in, in the sense that is it actually sending out a signal that is then received and compared in, in the sense of how did the wavelength shift from being sent to being bounced back? We don't know. But even if it is just pattern light, that's what the true depth sensor on the iPhone is, the, the face ID sensor. It's just shooting out a pattern of light and being able to see how does that change based on what geometry it's hitting. From the perspective of the information you get, it's still hardware level depth understanding, even if it's not as precise. And when you combine that with the computer vision they have, you have to remember back in the Connect One days, the, the modern computer vision was nowhere near as advanced as it is today. I don't think they need to have something that is a true, you know, a autonomous vehicle level LiDAR to be able to get hardware, useful hardware level depth information. Interesting stuff. Any last comments that you want to respond to? Really great comments talking about these new subjects today. We've got, uh, we should have the games cast back on Thursday after uh, some time off uh, a couple weeks back. And, uh, you know, like I said, Heaney, we've got uh, a lot of games that are going to ramp up through the rest of the year, as well as I think software releases. I think we're seeing in the summer here, Meta and a lot of other companies laying the groundwork for their strategy, not just going into the end of this year, but heading out into 2023, which, you know, we expected this year was going to be a big battleground year for headsets. But this uh, worldwide component issue really seems to have pushed out a lot of that battle, uh, maybe back six months to a year. And we're, we're going to see that in the coming months, aren't we, Heaney? Yeah, it, it seems that the, the battle that we expected was going to happen this year will happen in 2023 uh, just because of those unavoidable global supply chain issues that every 
company is dealing with, though obviously, as we've talked about before in this show, especially when talking about links, it's hitting those small startups a lot harder than it is the bigger companies who can make these agreements. Uh, Richard Miller asking, could Cambria, could Cambria be more powerful in Quest 2, which was underclocked? Uh, yes, absolutely. The, the findings from firmware sleuths suggest that Cambria will have uh, two cooling fans rather than one, which should allow for a much higher clock speed in that, as you point out rightly, Quest 2's CPU is heavily underclocked. So even if it does use the same processor, it can still be faster. And as uh, import logs have suggested that we reported on about a month ago, I think was found by sadly it's Bradley and his Discord associates again, Cambrio could potentially have double the RAM of Quest 2. So that's even more of a potential. Uh, so someone else in the comments a while ago asked if Quest 3 could use two XR2 processors. That's not quite how this works. Uh, you can't just add two system on a chips together to make them faster. Yes, you, if you look at the design of Apple's M1 and M2 chips, they have a, they, they've designed at a hardware level to be able to be kind of stitched together like that. But that's not something that Qualcomm's chips are designed to do. And just the entire architecture would need to be completely different because what matters in these chips is the distance between the subcomponents and how you transfer data from A to B, from the CPU to the RAM, from these different parts of the, of the chip. And you basically have to design it so that there's a very, very fast interface right beside all of the main components that can be stitched together. Maybe that's something we will see in future Qualcomm processors. Well, so some of Qualcomm's last briefings with media, they've shown off some of their split rendering concepts where the headset does some tasks and then a separate compute puck does some tasks. And I think that might have been on the XR1 Gen uh, chip that they were doing some of those things. But I think that's interesting where you what I'm just discussing either has a wire running from two components that are pretty far apart versus... Uh, I think their latest gen, they were showing off some wireless connection between those two components. But, you know, Qualcomm has pitched this idea of split rendering. But I think that's interesting, Heaney, you bring up this idea that physical distance between the components could be a limiting factor there, right? Yeah. So what Qualcomm calls split rendering is really just a marketing term for what virtual desktop and Airlink already do. And Guy Godin has pointed this out before. I think it's either in our comments or on Twitter. It's not really split rendering in the way that people imagine. It's not that some rendering tasks are being handled by your the headset and some by the PC. What they mean by that is the PC or the compute puck or you know the phone does the rendering, and then the headset reprojects it so that it's you know there's less latency. That already happens in Airlink and virtual desktop by Qualcomm's marketing definition. Virtual desktop and Airlink already are split rendering. There is a potential that in the future we could see real split rendering where, for example, a cloud system could render the environment and things that are far away from you and the local headset could render your hands and your controllers so that they feel low latency. But that is not something that has, to my knowledge, I would please someone tell me if I'm wrong here, that is not something that has ever actually been demonstrated. It would be great because you could do, for example, cockpit games uh, on standalone that are not computationally possible where you have the cockpit around you and your hands and the steering wheel or the, the flight stick is all locally rendered and everything outside the window you know be it the racetrack and the other cars or in a flight simulator the entire world is cloud rendered or rendered by the pc but again not so much as a tech demo has ever been shown for that and i would that's something i would love to see a tech demo for but not nothing yet interesting interesting concept i do think about that Maybe you should look at that. I don't know if you looked at the the slide deck that was sent out as part of the Meta, Metaverse Standards Forum, but they did talk about how you could progressively load assets in the future. And I, I wonder if you kind of need a, a platform that handles that much of, of like the entire rendering pipeline before you can realistically split tasks up the way you're talking about. Yeah, you need a very different engine than what we have today. It would need, like, the vast majority of apps for VR games are made in Unity on Unreal, and it's just not something that these engines were ever designed to do. The idea of actually rendering some objects on one device and the rest of the world on another device, it's just completely alien to the way that they're set up. 
it'll be it'll need for a demo to be done of this it'll likely need to be done in a custom engine and very few apps use their own custom engine though interestingly enough an app that does use its own custom engine is virtual desktop so i don't know maybe gig godin someday will get the time to make a demo of that but again it wouldn't it, that wouldn't be something that applies to existing games it would be something that would be a very specific demo but uh yeah it's the key point here is that what qualcomm calls split rendering is just a marketing term for what we already have mm. Well, I think that's it for us this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back here next week, next Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific, broadcasting live. Again, apologies for traveling last week so we couldn't do the live audience interaction. Uh, we absolutely love interacting with our audience out there, and thank you so much for the conversation and comments. Uh, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share this link out with others, and uh, come back on Thursday for the Gamescast. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in the future. <laughs>